there, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game, The Mind, designed by Wolfgang Varsh and published by Pandasaurus Games, who helps sponsor this video. I, I, it's not, it's not here. Uh, one second. There it is. So to play this game, there are two main requirements. First of all, you have to be able to count to 100. So if you can do that, you're already off to a good start. You also have to be able to telepathically transfer your thoughts to the other players. Can't do that? Well, don't worry, because I'm going to teach you to. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, find the double-sided bunnies and throwing stars, and deal one throwing star and a number of bunnies equal to the number of players. In this case, we're going to set up a game for three players, and we'll set the rest of the cards to the side for now. Now find these level cards and put them in order from 1 to 12 with the one on top. If you have two players, you'll use all of these, but if you have three as we're setting up here, keep levels 1 through 10, but return 11 and 12 to the box. And if you have four players, only use levels 1 through 8. Either way, you'll now set this deck to the side of the play area. Now find the rest of the cards which have this back and are numbered 1 through 100, and give them a thorough shuffle, dealing as many cards to each player as the current level. So, one each. During the game, you can always look at your own cards, but never show them to another player. And that's the setup. In the mind, players are working together to complete all the levels in this deck. And to complete a level, all they have to do is empty their hand of cards. They'll do this by playing them to the center of the table in numerical order, from lowest to highest. So if I had a 10, and you had a 50, and the other player had a 60, I'd need to play my card first, then you'd go second, and then they would go. Sounds pretty easy, right? Well, there's a catch. We can't talk to each other, or make signals that would reveal what we have in our hands. So that means we have to wait and play the cards when we think we should. Now, I know I have the 10. So should I play it right away, or should I wait a moment? What if you have the five? Well, how long do I wait? If I wait too long, you might play your card out of order. You know you have the 50. How long do you wait? And that's the challenge. So let's go back to the table, and I'll show you how this works. At the start of a level, each player puts one hand in the center of the table, like this. And once everyone is ready, you remove your hands together as a signal that the game has begun. This helps people get focused and know, all right, we've started playing now. And at any point later, even during a round, you can say stop, and everyone has to put their hand back on the table as a way of refocusing the group, which can be important in later rounds when things get more and more challenging. Now, as I mentioned, the objective here is for all of us to play all of the cards we're holding in ascending order in the center of the table from lowest to highest. Now, I'm holding the 10, so I might wait for a moment like this. and then play my card. Now everyone, still holding cards, checks to see if they have one in their hand that is lower than what was just played. If so, then we made an error, and those players will call out stop and reveal the values that were skipped over. In this case, no one stopped the play, so everything's fine and we continue. And perhaps now, after a longer pause and some shrugs and hesitation, you decide to play your 50. This player didn't stop the game, so we know we're okay. And they have the only card left, so they can just play it. And the level is complete. Everyone's hands are empty. We now return the completed level card back to the box and collect all the numbered cards together, shuffling them well. Then a number of these are dealt to the players, again, equal to the current level. So two in this case. The round begins just as before. Everyone puts a hand in and then draws them back to start. Let's say I have the 12 this time, and I play it quickly. Too quickly, in fact, and once it's on the table, the other players groan and stop the game. And they do this because this one had a 5, and this one had the 11. So an error was made. And when this happens, every number that was skipped over is revealed, and then slid under the center pile. Now, no matter how many cards were just skipped, we'll now lose a single bunny, setting it to the side. And these represent our lives. As soon as the last one would be discarded, the game would immediately end. But we still have some left, so we can continue. And you don't reset anything. You just have everyone refocus and keep playing from the 12 that's on top. And let's say that the other players make it through the rest of the level. When they go to remove this card, you'll notice there's a symbol here in the bottom corner. 
This is the reward that you collect for finishing that level. In this case, a throwing star, which you'll take from the ones that you set aside during the setup, adding it to your play area. If we finish the next level, we'll instead get an extra life. And if you're doing so well that you would gain a reward, but there are no extra cards to take, then you just ignore the reward. Now though, let's take a moment and explain what these throwing stars are for. At any point during a level, if the team has any throwing stars, a player can raise their hand as a signal to the other players that they think one should be used. If the others agree, they also raise their hands. But if not everyone does, the star will not be used and the game just continues. However, if everyone does raise a hand, a star is set aside, and everyone places the lowest card they have in their hand face up on the table in front of themselves. Now understand, this card in the center is still the last card that was played, and this is where new cards will continue to go. But now everyone can look around the table and get a clue as to what people have left in their hands. For example, this 35 was the lowest one just revealed. So we know everyone has cards higher than that in their hand. This player put out an 82, so we won't expect to see them play for a while. Also, using the star just helped everyone get rid of one card from their hand. And for this player, that was the last card they had, so they can sit comfortably while the remaining players figure out the rest of the level. But just to be clear, these cards are never played into the center pile. They're just here to give us clues about what is remaining. Another key rule is that players may only ever play the lowest valued card in their hand. So in a case like this, the only card I'd be able to play would be my 7. And this is important because some people might consider playing a 100, for example, as soon as the round starts, forcing everyone to discard all of their skipped cards face up, which would be every card. And in that way, yes, they did just lose one life, but they also just beat the level. So that might be a reasonable sacrifice for some players. However, if this player wants to play their 100, they'll first need to play these other cards, one at a time, out of their hand. One thing I should mention is that sometimes you'll have cards in value that are very close together in your hand. I might even have the 40 and the 41, but I am not allowed to play them together at once. You always have to play your cards one after the other, though obviously I'll play these ones as quickly as possible. And that's how you play the mind, and you'll continue playing levels like this until you either run out of lives, meaning you've lost, or you complete all of the levels. What you'll often find is that after losing, if you play again, you'll get further along as your group develops a sense of rhythm and timing, which can often surprise you with players playing cards in rapid succession without any mistakes, simply because they're learning about the pace at which each of them play. If you do win the game, you'll unlock the advanced rules, which are printed on the other side of this rules sheet down in this area, but I don't want to show it to you because you're not intended to read that until you've won. So I'll leave that for you to discover at that time. Before we wrap this up, I should just quickly address the question of exactly how much communication is allowed in a game of the mind. We know that the rules say that players are not allowed to talk to one another. And you can certainly play this game very strictly, sitting stoically and not giving any kind of communication, nonverbal or otherwise, to the other players. But in practice, and even by the designer's own admission, this is not how he or most people play. Oftentimes, there'll be some kind of signaling to the other players. For example, if I had a really high number in my hand, maybe the 89, I might lean back in my chair as a way of not telling the players exactly what number I have, but that I have no intention of playing at any time soon. If a player thinks they should go next, but they aren't quite sure, they might slide their hand in slowly, waiting to see if anyone else gives the impression that they have a card that they want to play first. In my experience, each group will find the edges of what they consider to be acceptable nonverbal communication and follow that as their guideline. If you have any questions about anything that you saw here, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. You'll also find forums for discussion, pictures, other videos, and lots more over on the games page at Board Game Geek, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. If you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing, giving it a like, and clicking that little bell icon so you get notifications when new videos come online. But until the next episode, thanks for watching. <laughs>